we'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on Mastering Phylogenetic Tree Creation and Optimization with Megaline Pro. In today's webinar, Brian is going to show you from the very beginning how to do a multiple alignment and generate the distance statistics and also phylogenetic trees, of course, using a bunch of different algorithms and options. And he'll explain when to use certain options as needed. Um, he's then gonna show you how to change the style and the balance of the tree before exporting an image of it that you could use in a presentation or a paper. Um, I'm, my background is as a phylogeneticist. Uh, I became active as a phylogeneticist in the, uh, I guess, mid 1990s. Um, I kind of consider that the golden age of phylogenetics. It was kind of this um, convergence of uh, computer technology finally getting to a stage where uh, it was just a really good union between that and um, um, Sanger sequencing, uh, developing good Sanger results. I kind of refer to it as the golden age because it was a time when it's just a wide open frontier. Almost anything you worked on, um, there just wasn't a lot of background on it. Uh, it was really easy to be the first to sequence something in your field, uh, which was kind of the case for me. I was the first person to um, publish a, a DNA sequence phylogeny based on uh, capsicum sequences. Uh, capsicum are chili peppers. Um, and kind of a theme I'm looking at through this webinar today is I, I just wanted to go back and take a look to see how far, um, I guess, a capsicum phylogeny has progressed uh, in the last 20 years. Um, so I'll get to that just in a moment. Um, I think that covers about everything. So I'm going to drop out of uh, PowerPoint and go into the software. And at the same time, I'm also going to turn off my webcam just to make sure there's enough bandwidth to handle all the different softwares I have running at the same time. Uh, so you won't see me, but I'm still I'm still here. Okay, so what you should be seeing is uh, a place where I usually start is with the DNA Star Navigator. This is a little application um, that's kind of a quick quick launch to our different applications. Uh, we have different applications that are specialized um, for, for different uh, purposes. And when you first go to the DNA Star Navigator, if you're not accustomed to our software, um, this is what you'll see. Uh, it's kind of a, a list of different workflows that you can stem off of to help you get started. There's, if you're familiar with the application names, there's a little icon you can choose uh, to work off of the names. Today, we're going to focus on Megaline Pro. So here, I'm just launching that. And the first thing we're going to see, uh, this is opening a little slower than normal, just because I've got a lot of computer software running. Um, It'll open up to the splash screen, and this is a little bit new in the last, I would say, year or so. Uh, so I just wanted to walk through this super quick. Um, just a, a resource on the training, uh, working from the bottom up. There's a training tab uh, that'll take you to some really useful um, online help. Uh, usually when I'm in a pinch, I can go there and find my answer. Uh, we have some search tools uh, that'll reference NCBI. Uh, typically, I open up to the open project screen, and this is where if you have an existing project, you can load it in. Um, and last of all, up here is the new project, obviously, uh, if you want to start something new. There's a couple options here. I'm not going to go into them in detail, but one is opening a blank project. Another is um, with different, um, if you have presets um, off set in the um, Basically, if you have presets, uh, it'll automatically apply those to your sample. Here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just grab this um, uh, GBK file I have and just drop it right in. You can also access that by traveling through the uh, um, loading in your sequences. All right. If you're wondering where to get started here, um, uh, you know, there's kind of a lot um, being displayed at the same time. We're going to focus on just doing the alignment at this time. And uh, just before I get started, I just wanted to say where these sequences came from. So I had gone up to search, and there's a couple different search options uh, for NCBI, just like we had seen in that earlier page. Uh, the particular page I used 
is searching off of text. And I'm not going to go through that with this, but just to bring you up to speed, I added a field. And first thing I searched off of was organism, and I had typed in the plant family Solanacea, which is huge. And the second keyword I plugged in was uh, the gene, which there it is. And um, my previous work had used a, a nuclear gene called Waxy, so I had typed that in. So it was Solanacea and Waxy. Uh, what I, I ended up with, I can't even remember, I think it was over 1,300 um, samples I, I downloaded. Just going to skip over that. And for purposes of this talk, I narrowed it way back to just a, a portion of a subfamily within Solanacea. So that's where the data came from. And the next thing is I actually like to look at my sample names for my taxa. They mean more to me than these GenBank accession numbers, which are the default. So I'm going to change those. So the first thing I want to do is uh, select all the samples I want to change the name of, in this case, all of them. So I'm, I'm working on a Windows computer. I'm going to press Control A, just a hot key for selecting everything. And I'm going to do a right click. And here I could rename the fields. So the default is accession number. I want to see organism. I'm just going to add that in there. It gives me a little preview at the bottom here. I actually want the organism name first. And I'm going to leave the organism name. I'm sorry, I'm going to leave the um, accession number in there. Uh, I guess I don't need to for my purposes, but I have multiple taxa with the same name. Um, so this would be a way to tell them apart if there was some reason I needed to come back to this. And at this point, I just wanted to show you something um, quick in the, these different views. So here's my sequence view, but uh, just moving up here briefly to the overview. Here I'm at a fine detail of the sequence, and up here's a, just a, like, kind of like a, I guess it doesn't make sense, but a bird's eye view of your DNA strand, uh, your sequence. And I can pop this out rather than rearrange the different um, bars that are separating the different fields. And, you know, and a, a kind of a cool thing about separating the sound is I can actually move this to a separate monitor if I wanted. But what I wanted to show you here is I have a bunch of sequences from different studies over the last 20 years. And they're obviously from different studies, they're going to be using different sequence primers and they're of different lengths. So I'm not going to expect these all to be covering the same region. I'm clicking up here just to pop that window back in place. So at this point, I'm going to do the alignment. And we have a number of different uh, places you can quick access the alignment. Um, there's a kind of a quick button here. You can also go up to align. And we have four alignment methodologies that are typically used for your Sanger alignments. Uh, I'm not going to go into MOV today, but this is where if you were working with uh, genomic sequences uh, where you might have inversions, uh, they would not be possible to align using these other methods. Uh, but in general, I actually prefer these four whenever they're applicable. And I recently did a, a, a blog interview uh, with Sharon where we looked at each of these four methodologies to assess their pros and cons. I actually found since I work with uh, nuclear data, which is prone to have a lot of indels, uh, that MAFT by far uh, has the best performance. Uh, so I'm going to get that running. And something I'm going to get to in just a moment is this view. Um, the style view has a number of different panels that correspond to windows on the side here. Uh, and there are different controls that you can use to um, adjust, uh, I guess, visually what you're seeing on the other side. Uh, and just one thing I'm going to do with the overview is when I, I had a lot of samples in here and um, just something to try to make it so I can view more at once. Just going to shrink that spacing a little bit. All right. And just to quickly tell you something else, too. Uh, up here in the overview, that overview of the sequence, this little slider here corresponds to this window. All, all the screens that we're looking at today are dynamic, so um, different things you do on one will impact the screens on the other. And at this point, I just want to zoom back into the overview. I'm going to stop doing that in a moment. But I just wanted to show you that uh, previously these bars were gray and they were of different lengths. 
Now it's showing me the length of the entire alignment. And it's also showing me um, the green section is where the actual sequence is falling out in reference to other samples. Here I'm scrolling, scrolling down as we're looking. And one thing I'm seeing is there's these sequences have a much shorter span than the others. And I want to have some sequence data for, I guess, for all my samples. Since these look the smallest, I'm going to actually base my alignment off of the length of these. And I'm going to put that slider bar so I can more easily find that first row. Pop these back. <clears throat> Excuse me. And at this point, I need to scroll down a little bit to find that area. So it looks like it's right about here, that, that area uh, of interest. And at this point, I want to trim off this extra sequence. Uh, a lot of sequences don't share this extra data. And it's really kind of a problem if you don't trim off those ends. Um, the two biggest problems being that um, the phylogenetic software or, what, or the phylogenetic algorithm will look at these sections and say this one, this particular position, and I'll see T's there and say there was a few more samples also with T's at that position. It'll go through and, and look at those and say all these samples have the same character at this position they're closely related to each other and everything else has missing data so you could be um, skewing your data toward erroneous um, associations just based on missing data uh, that happens if you have a lot of missing data and, it, and similarly if you have a lot of missing data like with these hanging ends um, when you're doing support values typically they go through and do a random sampling like with bootstraps and uh, these large amounts of missing data end up giving you lower support values than you would if you actually trim the data. Um, everybody wants higher support values so you can make more uh, assertive conclusions on your data. Uh, so I'm, here I'm going to trim this off. And we have three different ways we can do this. One of them is you can just drag this bar up here across. Uh, that's kind of coarse grain. I'm not going to do it that way. Um, more fine scale is you can grab the bar and just drag it over and it trims off whatever's on the other side. And you can go back if you want. Um, I actually prefer this other way since I have more than one screen length that I'm jumping across. You just want to highlight that last base that you want to be the first base. And I'm going to go up to sequence. Trim selection to alignment, um, to trim selection from start. And here it's trim that off. I'm scrolling up and down here. I can see I've trimmed off everything. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Looks like right about here. That's where I want to trim the data. Just selecting that region again. Sequence, trim alignment to selection from the end. <coughs> All right, last time I go up to this screen, let's make it big. Here I'm scrolling up and down and I can see that all my sequences are trimmed to the same length. Uh, they're more or less fully intact. I got a little piece missing there, that's okay. All right, so I'm pretty much done with the overview at that point. And the, the next step I would do is go through my sequence itself. And once again, I keep popping this uh, larger overview, large. You can do the same thing with the other windows as well. The next step I would do is scroll through my um, alignment and just make sure everything looks in order. Typically around indels, you'll, you might see something where the alignment might be off. Um, I'm just gonna, for purposes of time, uh, I have a lot to show you. Um, I'm just gonna let it pass that everything looks good this time. Uh, let's see. Good place to move to next is uh, some of these other windows. Um, there's a few tabs down here at the bottom I haven't used yet. So far, I've just been focusing on the overview and the sequence tabs. Um, you can also do pairwise alignments if this is something of interest to you. Here I have the first sample um, already selected. I'm just going to choose the second one. Um, this is a really useful tool if you're looking for a quick percentage identity between two samples, and it also highlights um, the places where there's variance. Um, you know, just pointing out now, there's a little quick tools on all these windows. I'm not going to go into them in detail on this one, but I'll, I'll go into this in more detail toward the end. 
uh, moving on to a separate window, the distance table. And we've kind of expanded upon the capabilities in this window. Um, I don't know if you noticed this when I clicked on the, on the window. Here, I'm going to go pairwise again. And the, the style panel actually helps direct you to where you're supposed to be. Here, I went pairwise and I opened up that window, go back to distance, brought that distance um, tab front and center. So what we're looking at here, it's a large table. And then the upper right, corresponding up here, it's showing me percent identity in a cross-reference between all the samples. And then the lower right is distance values. And there's a number of different um, options we can choose from. Personally, I actually find distance and percent identity uh, to be the probably the most commonly used. And a couple features about this, if you hover over a cell, it'll show you the, um, the specifically the reference parameters. You know, if I'm right here at this close, that's not that much of a help. But if I'm way out here somewhere, um, it's easy to get a little bit lost. So you can use that as a way to help identify some value that maybe doesn't look quite right to you. Um, let's see, it's looking pretty good. All right, I'm gonna move on to the tree view at this point. And um, our software used to automatically jump right into a uh, neighbor joining analysis with BioNJ. Uh, since we've introduced a second methodology, uh, maximum likelihood using RaxML, we give you the choice first. And uh, a, a really big reason for this is also kind of hits upon the pros and cons of each of these. Um, neighbor joining is really fast if you have very few samples. Um, maximum likelihood is, is also fast, but um, the with increasing sample numbers, uh, the neighbor joining methodology takes substantially longer, um, where maximum likelihood is kind of designed for running many thousands of samples. Um, so maximum likelihood, if you have say a thousand or 2000 samples, will finish way earlier than neighbor joining, um, probably several orders of magnitude sooner. Um, Neighbor joining also is very good for looking at closely related samples. The more distantly related the samples are that you're looking at, the less accurate it becomes. Um, maximum likelihood kind of doesn't have that, um, that, that handicap. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, neighbor joining. I'm just going to click that. And from here, it's kind of one of the quick launch options. We can choose between our different methodologies. Let's just get that neighbor joining tree running. And here, completed, oh, I'm sorry, completed. I'm just going to shrink it down a little bit so I can see it. And we have that tree done. And here's a tab I haven't introduced yet. It's up here in the Explorer tab. This is actually a little tab for keeping track of your trees as you go through. Um, you, can, you can generate more than one tree at a time. And something about the neighbor joining tree, excuse me, something about the neighbor joining tree is that um, it updates in live time, um, which I'm going to show you just briefly in a little tree comparison methodology. Um, so if I want to take a picture of the tree, what it looks like now, I need to click on this little icon here called take a snapshot. This will give me a, a static version of that tree that I just populated up here, tree two. And tree one is going to change if I change any parameters. Like for instance, if I go to the distance table, uh, neighbor joining is based off of the distance table. And I can come in here. Here's a, one of those little quick launch icons. I'll cover these more in a little bit. Um, I can actually change which distance metrics are being used, basically how they're being calculated. Here's one where I'm removing gaps. And I change that those distance values. And they're going to change a little bit. I didn't look to see what they are here, but I should be able to visualize them in my tree. Oops. Let's click on it here. And you know what? I'm done with the overview up here. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually change this view to accommodate what I'm trying to look at. Um, so instead of looking at two stacked windows down here in this little corner, I'm gonna choose since I'm gonna compare two trees, I'm gonna look at two vertical windows. And I can come over here and actually move any of these icons around to the different views. I'm going to put tree one on the left, keep tree two on the right. 
I'm just going to resize, excuse me, resize them quick just so we can compare them. So at a glance, the trees look really similar. Um, but I changed the distance matrix, uh, methodologies and they may look a little different. Um, so I'm going to look at how you might be able to compare two trees. Um, but at the same time, we'll also be looking at, well, I, I guess at this point, I'm going to move on to just be able to compare trees. This is something I actually get asked quite a bit. Um, so here I took two trees and just made some little changes to the distance matrix, and we'll see if it's telling the same story. Um, so here I can see the, the structure of the trees looks a little different, um, but it's, it's really not a fair comparison just to look the way or I guess just to look to see if the organization is different. You kind of need to look at them in, in more detail. Um, and I'll frequently have people ask me, they'll, they'll bring in a, a tree that was made, say, in classic Megaline, and they want to be able to reproduce it in Megaline Pro. And, and if the tree isn't organized the same, uh, it's not going to look the same. It's like looking at two graphs, one, say, a bar graph and the other uh, a dot plot. They might be telling the same story, but you can't tell just by looking at them at face value. You need to interpret the data a little better. So here I'm going to organize these trees. And one way to do this, well, one of the two methods we have is by rooting, which on here, the root is way down near here near the bottom. And it's mixed in with a bunch of capsicum. By the way, I don't know if I pointed this out. Capsicum is the genus for chili peppers. That'll come into play in a little bit when I actually look at the data a little bit. Um, so the placement of the root is a hypothesis that you're applying to your data set. Um, generally, you use that root to designate something that's more distantly related than everything else. Uh, so it's kind of a proposed hypothesis. And we have two different rooting methodologies. I'm going to go up to tree and root on. And the two methods are you can either select a branch to root off of, or you can choose midpoint, which I'll choose right here. Here it's kind of looking at the distance values and putting the tree roughly equidistant from the two most distantly or from the two most distant and it separates the tree here i'm looking at a whole group of, of capsicum some on this side it looks like pretty much everything else not capsicum is separated on the other side um, that's one way to do it um, from looking at uh, previous phylogenies of capsicum uh, and Solanacea in general, I happen to know that with this data set, this Nothocestrum is the most re uh, distantly related sample. So I can go up to tree, root on, selected branch. It just, once again, all I did was just select that branch and, to designate it. Just to do that really quick with this branch, Nothocestrum, root on selected branch. Here I can get a better layout of the, the relationship of the samples. Um, just looking at the coupling as I pass through here, I can see a minor difference here. Um, so just by changing the distance matrices, I was able to actually rearrange the structure of the phylogenetic tree. And uh, so I mentioned changing the root. There's another way you can um, visually change the structure of the tree without changing your data at all. And here I'm going to go up to tree and you can order the trees uh, by ascending to descending. Um, currently these are kind of a quasi ascending order. Uh, we have the most distantly related here and everything kind of tapers down almost like a wedge point. However, if you look at the internal clades, they're actually doing the opposite. So we kind of have a overarching ascending, uh, but descending in the subclades. So here I'm going to organize them all as, well, I, I'll show you what descending looks like first. I'm just going to choose this. Oops, you know what? I had a, a particular section of the tree clicked, so I only partially. There we go. So it's kind of that tapering effect I was talking about, kind of a wedge shape that tapers up with descending. And 
I'm going to choose ascending because it's just my personal preference, how I prefer to view trees. And I have two options that I'm offered. I can um, either uh, order by depth or by distance. In my particular data set, uh, it makes almost no difference. There's some super minor changes that take place. Um, but that would be something you might want to look at in your personal data sets when you're working with it. So here I assorted, I'm sorry, sorted by ascending and depth. So I have these two trees organized identically. So at this point, if I wanted to compare the two trees to see if there was any difference, this would be um, the steps I would want to do to take that. And I can see that these trees are not identical. There's some minor differences here. You know, and without even going further, I can see it right here at the basal samples. All right, having said that, I'm going to move on to um, doing a maximum likelihood anal uh, sample, I guess phylogenetic analysis. And, uh, you know, when we first went to the tree tab, there were no trees, so it gave us the option to choose. Uh, since I already have trees, uh, there's some other places we can choose to, to do phylogenetic analyses as well. Um, one of the quick launches is right here. Quick look on quick, quick launch options. Um, over here next to the trees, we can also activate a, a phylogenetic analysis as well. And similarly, up here in the tree, first choice. So here I chose maximum likelihood of kind of getting an accumulation of trees. I'm just going to rename this one maximum likelihood. And here, bootstrap analyses are your support values. And if you're doing something quick just to see, you know, what does my data look like? 100 bootstrap iterations is pretty good. If I was publishing, I'd want to do 1,000. Um, for time's sake, I'm just going to do 10. And here we have seed and threads. I'm just going to talk about those while uh, this is running. Um, that seed is uh, just a, a random seed value. Um, sometimes, well, actually frequently, people when they're publishing will list the seed that they use to calculate um, their phylogeny. And if you wanted to come back and recreate that, uh, it's something that would help be able to make it identical. Um, and that last entry was threads. It's just uh, something your the software is kind of assessing for you to allow RaxML to best run most efficiently. Uh, since RaxML can handle many thousands of samples at once, which might take hours, um, it's just an attempt to maybe shave off some of those hours. Um, it'll look at how many threads it's capable of running on your specific computer. Something I want to draw your attention to is down here at the bottom in this corner is a little status bar for this run. I can actually go and do other things in the software and it'll just keep running that. Um, it's something I've noticed, the uh, this phylogeny actually took twice as long while running the webinar as it normally does. Um, up here, I have my maximum likelihood tree. Um, populated in my list and I'm just going to get my bearings over so here's tree one and maximum likelihood tree is also visible here I am going to I guess visually make this tree look just like my other one so I'm going to tree sort actually I'm going to do rooting first you know what something I just want to introduce I'm looking for that sample called Nothosustrum. Nothosustrum. I can actually do quick searches of my samples. This would be really handy if you had thousands of samples. I just typed in part of the name and hit return. It took me down there. Samples already highlighted. I'm just going to root off of that. Oops, I guess I got to click on it again. And I just wanted to organize the tree as before. All right, here I have my two, like a kind of comparison of the two samples. Um, so what we'd see in this, um, comparing this phylogeny method as well, it, it works off of completely different parameters. And I would expect this phylogeny to be different than either of the previous two I would show you. Um, phylogenies are very, the, the tree that you get is very um, susceptible to any changes in the data. If you start removing samples, um, tweak the alignment, uh, maybe to 
account for um, some kind of mispairing or, or the way an indel is handled um, can have effects on your overall alignment. Uh, so that was, once again, that was why I kind of uh, recommended going through your alignment at the beginning, just to make sure everything looked good. Um, so what I'm looking at here is, um, you know what, at this point, I'm just going to focus on my uh, maximum likelihood tree. So rather than have all these windows open, I'm just going to do the one, which is one. Just making sure what tree I have up there, maximum likelihood, yep. And scrolling down just to see it, I got lots of extra space. Let's just make that a little bigger for my sake. The default I'm looking at is the default values. And just going back to that style panel, move to the tree panel all by itself, uh, just because that's what I have highlighted or active. I can change between the distance values and I had run those bootstrap um, iterations for support. Here I toggled that over and I can see those bootstrap values. If you're not familiar with bootstrap values, 100 is as high as they go. So this particular clade is highly supported. In fact, all these clades and subclades. Um, once you start getting out to some of these other ones, they're less reliable. Um, you shouldn't really interpret them as a percent. Um, generally, like 100 is great. Uh, 90 is pretty good. Uh, once you start getting down to, I'd say, below 80 or, or even 70, it starts being kind of dubious. Um, just trying to think to myself if I've missed anything here. Let's see. I think at this point, I'm going to look at just my data really quick. So I kind of chose this sample just to look at the status of Capscom over the last 20 years based off of the data I scooped out of NCBI. And just looking down the row, I got outgroup samples. And here's where um, my Capscom samples, my chili peppers began. And, and one thing I'm seeing right away, and here I'm going to emphasize some of the different um, visualization tools to help um, make things in the data pop out that you're trying to talk to or talk about in a say a publication or a poster i'm going to select this clade right here which is a group of capsicum and just to draw attention to that i'm going to change the color of that clade i'm going to make it red and you know and just to make it pop out a little further you know i got a a webinar control over my option that i'm trying to do so i'm going to actually move up to the to the quick tools up here. I'm going to click on this color palette. And I can actually change the line width. I can do that same thing here. I just I can't get access to it. All right. So drawing your attention to this clade, uh, what I'm looking at here is one clade of capsicum. And there's another one over here that it's most closely related to that is a completely different genus. And just a way to interpret that is it's saying that this red clade I marked is most closely related to this Lysianthes group. Um, and this clade is more distantly related to the rest of capsicum. As far as um, phylogenetics go, that, that's a big no-no. Um, that strongly supports that this should be a different gen genus entirely. Um, and without saying, uh, this is part of a study that actually was, um, this is the data from a study that actually supported moving this to a different genus. And that's not surprising. I'm, I'm familiar with some of these samples, and, and they have an extra chromosome from all this other group. Um, these are chili peppers that form trees like 30 feet tall. Um, so, so yeah, I, I believe they don't belong there. Um, so just one of the tools we have at our disposal is uh, being able to color different sections of the clade. Um, here I'm just going to look at some of the um, domesticated um, sample. Um, so what am I saying? Uh, domesticated varieties within capsicum. Here's a group, uh, capsicum pubescence. I'm just going to color that clade a different color just to, let's choose green. Yeah, for some reason, I like to make that line a little bolder just to make them pop out. Um, there's one domestication of chili uh, capsicum. There's another one way down here at the bottom. Let's make that a different color. Um, Something different. Uh, 
and make that line just work a little bigger. So, so all right, I've kind of shown that one off, uh, making the lines different colors. Um, some other tools at your disposal are, you can actually um, mark the samples themselves. Here I have some uh, domesticated samples that are kind of mixed together. Um, Frutessens. A couple more down here. Here I'm holding down the control key just to be able to select other samples that aren't next to each other. And I'm going to choose the box icon. What is this going to do is put a box around the samples. And I can change the line width or, or whatever I want on those if I missed one. And mixed in here is another domesticated type. Just I clicked and shift clicked. And then I missed a few, so I can control click to catch those last ones. Miss anybody? One down here. I'm going to put a box around these two, but I'm going to make them look different. I'm going to change uh, the background that I'm seeing in there, something so they're visually much different. So these are two closely related uh, domesticated types, so I just wanted to be able to distinguish them apart from each other. You know, there's one other domesticated type in here. I just want to see if I can find it. Uh, Kinopodium, I'm sorry, Capsicum baccatum pendulatum. And it's kind of broken up in here. I'm going to color this a similar way. I'm going to, you know what, for this one, I'm just going to make it bold um, and increase the font. Uh, so these are some of the different tools you have at your disposal to be able to, to make what's in your data set pop out. And, and just, um, I was looking at Capsicum to begin with, just uh, a punchline I can see here. In my original paper, I proposed, in my publication, I proposed that there was five domestications, independent domestications of Capsicum. That's kind of what I'm seeing here. It looks like it's still holding true. Down here is Capsicum annuum, which is the most common type of chili pepper you're ever gonna see in the grocery store, at least if you're in the United States. Um, bell pepper, cayenne, um, jalapeno, all are in that same group. Um, here it's most closely allied um, to the wild um, capsicum chili peppers in Mexico. Um, here we have a mixture of two. Uh, frutescence is Tabasco, Chinense is habanero, and um, genetically they're almost identical. Um, they really don't divide up very well, I missed one. Um, however, morphologically and habitat growth, um, they're pretty much polar opposite. Um, so based on not morphological, but I'm sorry, based on morphological data, uh, and well, based on morphological data, they're, they're presumed to be different domestications. Here we have a third one, most closely related to wild type. Um, here's a group where nobody even knows what the wild type is. Um, so what I what I see here is looks like four and possibly five independent domestication events. Um, I would say five, and that's pretty much what most people agree with. Um, kind of wrapping it up at this point, um, I, I wanted to show you some of these quick launch tools. I've already gone through some of them through other means, that search functionality, if we wanted like I search for that sample. Um, here's those sorting and rooting commands. Here I can rerun a, a, a different um, phylogeny. The color tools, I was working off of those. Um, oh, here I'm, still, I'm exporting the tree, and I can either export the tree file as a NUIC or as a Nexus file. Uh, I actually prefer Nexus just because of what the software I would use uh, would like to accept. Uh, export different images. Um, you know, in this one, I'm actually going to show you a little bit. Um, here you can export in a few different formats. Um, PowerPoint's actually a pretty good one to use. I'm going to export that. I'm going to go over that quick, um, just in a moment. Uh, the last couple options are uh, printing. Uh, some quick tips, which say you uh, save this project and come back to it later. Here it gives you a hint on what you had done previously if, you're, if your notes aren't 
altogether perfect like mine. Um, it was aligned using MAFT, and here's that likelihood score when you publish um, with maximum likelihood, that's something you need to stick in there as well. Uh, and then that last one is to compute phylogeny. So let me go over to this PowerPoint that I exported. Uh, just something uh, cool I wanted to show you is, is the utility of this as far as if you had to make any adjustments in your tree. Looks like it doesn't want to open. There we go. Let's zoom in a little bit. Um, so something cool with these uh, PowerPoint formats is say I, I misspelled a name um, or something, I, I can make edits to the samples at this point. You don't want to move the branches, even though you can. Um, that's not something you want to do, but you are able to tidy up a little bit. Like here, that 70 is kind of, okay, that's not what I want to do there. Undo that. If I was doing this for real, I would zoom in a little bit more so I can select things better. There we go. So you can move the values around um, so that they're not stacked or, or in better places. Um, at the level of zoom I'm at, I need to focus on some of the larger things like the 100. Um, anyway, I just wanted to make, to make it clear there's different editing capabilities you can do. Um, I frequently used to use Adobe Illustrator, which you can, um, but if you're doing something more simple, um, you'd be really doing yourself a favor to use a more basic um, editing function like in PowerPoint. Oh, let me just think if I missed anything. I think I pretty much have everything covered that I wanted to cover. Um, I think at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions, um, but I'm gonna let Sharon be the person who calls that. Okay, yep, that sounds great. Thanks for that presentation, Brian. We have had tons of questions coming in. I tried to jot down some ones that um, I thought would be of the most general interest um, for you to answer now. And um, as a reminder, we are going to take all of the questions and try to answer those in the form of an FAQ on our website. And we'll send everybody that um, registered for today's webinar a link to that. That'll probably come out in a week or two. So anyway, so to get started, um, Michael is asking about, um, other than FigTree, which hasn't been updated in a while, what apps are available to manipulate trees that you export from Megaline Pro? And he particularly uses a Mac. Oh, okay. Oh, um, you know, but the only ones I can think of are FigTree and Archaeopteryx. There, there's probably some other ones out there as well. Um, Archaeopteryx is Windows only. Um, so FigTree is probably the only one I know of at the moment. So kind of stuck with that one for a while, huh? Right. But but I guess something I can offer is that um, being the scientific lead for Megaline Pro is, is I'm actually trying to bring in some of that functionality um, from these other softwares to, to add that utility to Megaline Pro so you don't have to resort to those applications. If there's something specific you're looking for that Megaline Pro doesn't do, let me know. Uh, that's something that our development team wants to know. We, wanna, we want to make this software the best it can for as many people as possible. That's a great point. And you're gonna show a slide later on that has your email address too. So people will be able to just send you an email directly, right, if they have. right. Absolutely, Ideas, I welcome Improvements, okay. Um, the next question is, how can I share trees with colleagues that may not have access to Megaline Pro? Like, can I export an image or a screenshot or HTML or what? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I kind of touched upon that, but I didn't actually explicitly say it. So um, I'm just gonna go back to Megaline Pro quick. Like in these um, quick launch tools, you have the ability to export tree I'm still screen sharing, right, Sharon? Uh-huh. Okay, excellent. Let's make sure you can tell what I'm talking about. Um, you know, another place where you can go to for these same functionalities where they're all a little more pulled together is you can export um, different things of interest. I forgot what exactly the question was asking to export, but you can export. Um, I think like an image of the tree. 
Oh, images, sure. So here you can export images of the different options. I had more than one tree, so each one is presented to me. Um, or you can export the data. Uh, for instance, if I wanted to export, um, I guess, a, a tree file that would be openable in FigTree, uh, I can use uh, this tree option here or the alignment. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different export functionality uh, to be able to send it to other applications. Okay, the, uh, the next question is, how important are bootstrap values? That's a good question. So um, it, it kind of depends on what you're working on, um, whether you need support values. There, there's other support values out there other than bootstrapping. Um, um, as a phylogeneticist, uh, I would not be able to publish anything without having some kind of support value associated with my tree. Um, and, and really it does, you know, even if you don't need the bootstraps, it does you a service in being able to uh, lend credibility to the relationship seen in your tree. Uh, if you want to assert something that you're seeing in the tree and you can show that there's excellent support for that pairing, that, that relationship, that's powerful. Where if it's just kind of a dubious relationship, where if you change something in the data matrix and the distance matrix and, and suddenly it pops up, that's not going to have a very good support value. Um, and it could questionably be an incorrect assessment. I have a kind of a corollary question that is my own question because that I was uh, interested too about bootstrapping. Is it always better to use the biggest bootstrapping value that you can given the constraints of your computer? Like if, if your computer can handle a thousand, should you use a thousand instead of a hundred or is there a kind of a cutoff point where it doesn't really make that much improvement? You know, if I was publishing, I'd go up to a thousand. Um, okay. You could go higher, but I, I don't know that it carries much value to it unless you were working with maybe something like on, on a genome level or something. Uh, basically what bootstrapping does is it takes a, a random sampling through your data. Um, and then just analyzes those positions uh, to see whether these clades are still supported, uh, these relationships. Okay. Um, so, you know, if you have something that's only supported once in your entire alignment, um, odds are it might get missed uh, just by a random sampling. Okay. Um, next question is, which approximation is better, neighbor joining, maximum likelihood, or Bayesian? How do I select one and how does that selection affect the tree results? Okay, so this is this question's a little more complicated than it, you might guess. <laughs> um, so, so there's several uh, phylogenetic methodologies um, available, uh, just some that haven't been listed or like, uh, I'm not sure how to say it, it's called UPGAMMA, up gamma, um, neighbor joining, maximum parsimony is pretty uh, commonly used one. Uh, I'm sure there's a few others I can't think of, uh, but there's a lot of methodologies out there and they all have their pros and cons. Um, as a phylogeneticist, pretty much the gold standard out there uh, that people publish is uh, maximum likelihood and Bayesian inference. Um, I frequently will publish both of those in the same article and you know, frequently they show pretty much the same tree. Um, but similarly, I also frequently we use maximum likelihood. So I don't actually choose one. I, I, I present multiple. And uh, you know, if something's supported in two of the three trees, I'll say that um, in my discussion. Um, okay. Um, which ones are best? Just super briefly touching upon that. Um, I mentioned maximum parsimony. Um, our software isn't doing that currently. I hope to bring that in at some point in the near future. Um, but it's a real simplistic methodology that just looks at um, each character and um, doesn't add all kinds of extra parameters. It just, it's a real basic um, analysis, but it's also really conservative. So something strongly conserved, I'm sorry, strongly um, supported in a maximum parsimony uh, analysis is, is really good. Okay. Uh, Neighbor joining, uh, it's based on a distance matrix. The more distantly related the samples, the, the less reliable it is. Um, it's actually pretty hard to get a, a data set that's actually perfect for using neighbor joining. Um, 
Maximum likelihood and Bayesian both use um, a whole battery of different parameters that are factored in. Um, it's really complicated. Uh, maximum likelihood is much easier to use than Bayesian inference. Um, but I, personally, I think they're both more or less the same. Um, you might get a little bit different results from each of them, though, because they, they ultimately are looking at different ways to define um, what is the best phylogeny if you had to sum it down to one. Okay. Uh, next question is, this is from Michael. Is it more appropriate to deduce phylogenetic relatedness from gene, CDS, or protein sequence alignments? Uh, kind of depends on your question. So, uh, like when I was looking at my capsicum sequences, um, I'm looking at really closely related samples. So I was looking at introns, uh, non-coding segments of DNA, because I figured there would be more variability, um, and and that worked much better than if I was looking at uh, within a gene um, or or at a coding region or even a translation. I wouldn't expect to see anything in a translation. Um, so it kind of depends on your question and what level you're at. Um, like for instance, if you're looking at uh, a translation, if you're looking at more distantly related things, your translations might be so wildly non-alignable um, that they might not be usable. And, and Megaline Pro will let you know if you're getting out to that upper threshold because uh, you, you might start not being able to produce distance matrix, matrices because you're just blowing away the algorithm um, in, in its attempts to try to accommodate a distance matrix. Um, so in that case, you might want to move to uh, just using the nucleotide section. Um, you know, if you if you have a specific example, I'd be happy to to give you my opinion on it. Um, okay, that's great. So Michael, yeah, you can uh, write to Brian at his email that he's going to show in his uh, in the slide later on. Um, the next question is from Math. Is it okay? So it's necessary for him that the organism name in the tree be in italics. So how can he make make those names be in italics using Megaline Pro? Still sharing my screen, I believe. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm gonna click on that color palette and there's an italics icon. Yeah, that easy. Just press the press the little I button and there you go. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So um the next question is let's see here. Oh, oh, hold on. That wasn't the question from Matt. The question from Math was, so the question that I just asked, I don't remember who asked that one about the italics, but uh, Math asked the following question. For amino acid sequences, is it okay to just perform a gap treatment, pairwise or global gap removal, after you do the alignment, instead of removing the end gaps like you did initially in today's demo? So I interpret that as removing um, gaps from within an alignment? Yeah, so he's saying instead okay. of doing that trimming that you showed to, to get rid of the gapped areas on the left and right of the sequences, could you just Our align screen. it as it was and then do the gap removal later? Um, yeah, yeah. So just to, just to put my thoughts in that, um, this data set doesn't have any large um, indels, but I, I have had uh, from working with other like nuclear data, I'll have maybe like a 300 base chunk of DNA stuck in there, you know, in the insert, and maybe two samples have it and it's identical through its entire stretch. Um, that's actually kind of a hindrance to the whole overall uh, reliability of the phylogeny. Um, so in that case. I would, and you've got to justify it in your paper or, or whatever you're doing, but I would probably trim out that like 350 base gap, um, but make sure I say that in the um, in the analysis, like in the methodologies and such. Um, trimmed out a large section that was only shared between two samples and it was identical. Um, you theoretically could do something similar um, by going through and excising these small gaps but again you're going to want to account for that to your um, uh, reviewers in a publication uh, and you start getting into a nightmare scenario trying to explain every single 
uh, in like gap that you're removing. Um, and also if there's small gaps like this, uh, the, the amount of hit you're taking to the reliability of your phylogeny isn't that much. Um, honestly, the larger the section uh, of missing data, uh, the more impact it has. Small little bits uh, won't influence it hardly at all. 